Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. Um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Andre Mudigdo, uh, Senior Wealth Advisor with Oriana, and my colleague, uh, Matthew Jones. Uh, we are pleased to present Oriana's summary of the Australian Federal Budget 2021, as well as some financial planning considerations. Um, before we start, a couple of housekeeping things to get over with. Uh, throughout our presentation, if you do have any questions, uh, please type them on the chat bar that you can see on the bottom hand, uh, center bottom hand there. Um, and we will endeavor to answer them uh, in the time we have left at the end. Uh, in terms of audio settings, please make, uh, make sure that they're on mute. Um, so we'll have a, everyone will have a better audio experience. And like always, happy for you to reach out to us at Oriana if there are some points you want to further clarify outside of this session or discuss your financial requirements. Uh, Matt and myself are duly licensed, both here in Hong Kong and Australia, um, to provide financial advice. So we are uh, well positioned to assist. So the agenda for today uh, would be to quickly run through some of the main points of the federal budget wrap up. Uh, sorry, the Australian federal budget. Um, I'll highlight any of the proposals that may have impact on people such as ourselves, uh, non-residents at the moment. And in addition to some of these measures, uh, it, it might also be something to discuss with your extended family members back in Australia. Uh, for instance, any of your parents who are uh, looking at retiring or already retiring, um, looking at more super contributions, for example. Matt will then uh, take over with uh, the key strategy considerations uh, where he'll go through some tried and tested strategies uh, to maximize your wealth while you're being overseas. So those are really the, the agenda for today. And uh, as always, if you have any questions, uh, please type them up in the chat box and we'll try to answer them towards the end of this presentation. Um, so without further ado, we'll go through this. Uh, so the Australian federal budget uh, 2021. Um, after a tumultuous 2020, uh, this budget uh, aims to continue providing a healthy environment um, and incentive to increase spending. Um, as you know, because of what's happened for the last 12 months, uh, the full focus of the government was to make sure that the climate, the environment uh, stays stable and conducive for uh, the recovery that's uh, the imminent recovery that's coming. And we're seeing uh, a little bit of the offshoots from that. Um, then, so this budget or the proposals in this budget anyway, aims to continue that trend uh, to make sure that we continue on this road to discovery and, um, you know, hopefully uh, uh, improve our, our standing uh, with, with other, uh, compared to other nations as well. Uh, so a lot of these proposals really were a continuation of the 20, uh, 2020 21 budget, um, but there were additional measures uh, released that provided um, additional benefits as well. So, just a few of the main pillars, if you like, of the budget. The significant de deficit remains. This means that, you know, because of the spending focus of the government, uh, Australia uh, for the last few years and the next few years going forward will continue to be in a significant deficit because of this. Having said that, our economic rebound. Um, help the government project a smaller deficit for last financial year. And this year it'll be smaller yet uh, compared to what was expected. Um, this faster than expected economic recovery has helped underpin uh, the budget's bottom line. But having said that, the economic recovery is still uneven and uncertainty around the outlook, economic outlook uh, remains elevated. So this is something that uh, we'll still be seeing going forward and a deficit situation will probably continue for the next few years yet. In terms of the taxation changes, uh, there weren't many significant ones. Uh, however, there, were, uh, there was a commitment to uh, continue some of the taxation changes proposed last financial year, which was quite significant. But there are still some updates that we need to be aware of, um, such as uh, the definition of tax residency, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of superannuation, um, if nothing else, from a wealth strategy perspective, this budget proposal provides the most benefits in this area. Uh, for those of you looking at retiring in Australia for some point, super or superannuation should be your focal point um, of your retirement strategy. Um, and the flexibility that this budget provides uh, makes it even more so. Um, if you are still not convinced, think about super being the only structure in Australia that can provide you with zero tax in terms of income and capital growth uh, when you do retire and start an income stream from your super funds. 
the uh, and Matt uh, in his segment will also touch on the further benefits of superannuation and how you can actually apply it um, in, in 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 real life. The other part uh, of this budget was quite interesting is the fact that. Uh, they are looking at we are looking at having an election, a federal election, sometime mid next year. So this was this has a bit of a feel of a pre-election budget, uh, you know, which means that it's more towards having more positive proposals going forward as opposed to, you know, a more somber, you know, here uh, introduction of new taxes, etc. One of the examples is the focus on women. Uh, there are a lot of new spending measures that was in, that was provided in this space, uh, including you know 1.1 billion dollars for initiatives tackling you know violence and harassment uh, 352 million for health and well-being of women and you know in total 1.9 billion earmarked for economic security uh, measures focused on women such as uh, for benefits such as um, health care etc cetera, etc cetera. so these are really main the, the main crux of the of the budget and we'll go through um, each of them um, in the next few slides in terms of personal income tax, while there weren't any significant changes, uh, we are still on track to implement stage three of uh, the government's tax plan. If you refer to the table down below, we can see that currently we are in stage two um, and th those are the tax rates. Notice on stage three, in on starting 1 July, 2024, uh, the 37% tax bracket is going to be removed, which represents quite a significant saving from a net tax outcome. Uh, you can see that between 45,000 to 200,000. Now the tax will be a flat 32, you know, 32, 32.5% if you include Medicare. And so that's a, that's a far removal from what we have at the moment, where between 90 to 180,000, you're taxed at a higher level. So that's something to really be aware of. And the other part is as um, in the next slide, as non-residents, um, as you know, uh, the tax itself will change as well as a, as a function of this. So what does that mean for non-residents? It means that if you do have any accessible income in Australia, such as rental property, shares, you know, any income that you're providing, that you're receiving back in Australia, then that also will benefit from the removal of that 37% tax rate, which means that potentially anyway, you'll have a better tax outcome. Um, when you do have to uh, declare tax in Australia. And uh, Matt, again, will will provide some strategies you can look at to further um, uh, make the, you know, further improve your tax returns, if you like, uh, when if you still need to uh, declare uh, tax in Australia. The other parts of the income tax changes um, really comes down to if you are already on the ground in Australia. So the government last financial year introduced a low and middle income tax offset, which means that if you had an income between 48,000 and 90,000, there's an, an offset of around $1,000, which was quite useful, especially during the pandemic years when employment was not that was quite uncertain. This is going to be extended for the next financial year. Uh, so for those of um, you know, our you know fellow residents on the ground in Australia anyway, uh, they'll receive this particular um, benefit. One benefit that might uh, uh, be relevant for non-residents is the idea of tax residency. As you know, Australia uh, taxes on worldwide income. So the fact of whether you are a resident or not a resident of Australia is quite important. One of the things that they've done going forward is to simplify the rules on establishing whether you are a resident or not in Australia, a tax resident or not in Australia. So you will be a tax resident in Australia if you spend more than 183 days or six months physically in any income year uh, in Australia on the ground, which means that, you know, <clears throat> this might be less relevant for those of you that are uh, you know, returning home to Australia for good. But for those of you that are jumping, you know, around jurisdictions, uh, there's a lot more clarity in terms of whether you'll be taxed in Australia or not. Um, it means that if you are in Australia for less than six months, and you also, I guess, satisfy more of the secondary rules, such as not having a principal residence in Australia, you have, um, you know, taxation ties elsewhere in other jurisdictions, then you might not be seen as a resident. So there's more clarity um, provided in the in, in that definition. Um, other changes is in terms again um, with regards to people already on the ground in Australia, such as Medicare levy surcharge, where 
if you don't have the right private health arrangements, you need to pay a surcharge. Those, thres those thresholds remain unchanged, which is also a bit of a benefit as usually they get changed or increased every financial year. In terms of superannuation, uh, this is where a lot of the changes or a lot of the proposals um, evolve around. And it evolves around the ability to contribute uh, closer to your retirement years. Uh, this provides a lot of benefit because you know, previously it was a bugbear for a lot of people wanting to put as much as they can into superannuation closer to their retirement years, right? Because they need to satisfy what's called the work test uh, to contribute after the age of 65, which means that, you know, before being able to contribute into super, they need to prove that they are actually in the workforce and um, receiving income. That work test is, uh, is going to be, is planned to be removed if the legislation is accepted and people between the age of 67 and 74 will be able to contribute into super, super without having to prove their work um, situation. This then flows on into the ability of you putting more than the yearly limits of 100,000 or 110,000 this year into superannuation. The bring forward rule uh, relates to the fact that you can bring forward three years worth of contribution limits, i.e. 300,000 in any one year. Previously, that was limited up to the age of 65. Now you can go up to age, uh, pro it's uh, proposed that you can contribute these funds up to the age of 74, which is quite a significant move. One of the other moves that you can also discuss um, for yourselves or for, for your extended family, if you like, back in Australia is if you are looking to sell your principal residence, you can actually use some or all of the proceeds of that um, of that sale up to 300,000 and put it into superannuation without it being uh, be counted for any type of limits, right? So you sell your home, part or all your proceeds can be put into superannuation without any, you know, without uh, breaching any limits. Uh, you can put up to 300,000 in terms of this particular um, concession. And previously you have to be over age 65. That has been reduced to age 60. So you can see this, this initiative to be able to you know, open up, if you like, the contribution ability of people to put more into super. The other part, and for those of you that has a self-managed super fund in Australia and, and, and concerned about what's called the, you know, the central management and control test, where if you have a self-managed super fund previously or currently, you need to only be absent in, from Australia for two years. After that, the residency requirement of the self-managed super fund might be breached. That two-year limitation is now extended to five years, which means that you can spend or you know, work for five years overseas and still be able to retain or meet uh, the trustee residency requirements, which is quite a benefit for those of you that are uh, looking at self-managed super fund um, solution. But please uh, give us a, a tingle and we'll, we can discuss whether it's of benefit for you or not. So you can see the other part is the increasing of cats, which happens naturally in terms of the indexation. So the concessional cap and Matt will go through the strategy uh, in more detail. The concessional cap are contributions that you can put into super and claim a deduction. You can now put up to 27,500. While non-concessional caps are you know, after tax contributions that you can put into super. So sale of proceeds, any cash you've got lying around, you can put 110,000 a year or 330,000 if you bring forward, you know, three years worth of limits. So those are the caps that has been updated and which you can actually apply uh, right now. Other measures really um, evolve around, you know, making sure that this budget uh, has every, uh, something for everyone from, each, you know, from different uh, parts of the scale, economic scale, if you like. Uh, you've got social security and aged care. Uh, the government has, um, in response of the HK Royal Commission anyway, uh, the government has released 80,000 more additional home care packages, um, which will bring the total number of home care packages to 275,000. A home care package is basically a, a concessional arrangement where you can access aged care in a very, um, in a very concessionary manner, if you like, and there, but there are only limited places. Uh, family home guarantees means that if you are a single parent with dependents, uh, the government's able to guarantee uh, a purchase of a home uh, with a deposit of uh, as little as 2%, um, which is probably far more generous than um, any other deposit 
uh, rates out there. But again, the, the, the places are limited. And again, it's probably not as relevant to us here overseas, but for, I guess, family members uh, that are looking at purchasing their first homes, uh, this might be of relevant. In line with this is also the super saver guarantee in which you can actually put in uh, contributions um, such as you can in superannuation, but actually have it, you know, saving and building up for your first home. Uh, and it's receiving tax concessional uh, treatments as well. So those are the type of things that this budget uh, is trying to attend to, making sure that uh, you know both ends of the you know economic scales, those starting upon the journey of owning a home, and those retiring at an aged care are 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 looking you know are being looked after. So really, in terms of the summary, um, the overall the overall intent is clear in terms of this budget anyway. It's to make Australia more of a competitive business destination in terms of making sure that the, the tax element is uh, much more uh, you know, comp competitive compared to other countries, uh, especially with that removal of the 37% tax rate, uh, providing more opportunities to contribute into superannuation, which is the, you know, the most tax effective um, retirement uh, platform, um, increasing funding for women, and to continue to support Australians in both ends of the scale, if you like, um, that, that I just mentioned previously. So really in a nutshell, that is the, uh, the gist of the budget. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Matt, uh, who can go through the second part of the session, looking at some strategies, uh, strategy considerations um, for Australians overseas. Uh, over to you, Matty. Thanks, Andre. Um, all right, so yeah, as Andre mentioned, we're just gonna go through some of the, the key strategy considerations um, and opportunities available for expats that are uh, based abroad, uh, mainly from a tax mitigation perspective. So um, as many of you may be aware, working overseas offers some great opportunities to build wealth tax effectively, um, not only in the form of lower salary tax, but also for, in the way of low to no tax on investment returns, um, as is the case for, for Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, however, there are two main considerations that, that face typically face Australian expats living abroad. Uh, the first being uh, tax considerations on Australian rural property, um, how to mitigate taxation on, on, these, uh, on your Australian property, um, which includes from a rental income perspective and also at the time of sale. Um, and secondly, the, the big two are repatriation and retirement, um, how to maximise the tax efficiency of repatriating back to Australia if you've been living overseas, um, which often falls in line with broader retirement planning as this is where um, most of the significant tax benefits are available from the Australian government. Um, so some of the things we'll go through is offshore tax structuring opportunities, the concessional tax rates, um, which Andre touched on, and the deductions from super for super, uh, contribution caps and eligibility, and the catch up and bring forward provisions that, that are available. With regards to property, um, not often investors purchase outright with cash, um, and therefore there'll be a debt or a mortgage which must be serviced. Um, the two types are positive gearing um, and negative gearing. Positive is where you receive more rental income um, than what you are uh, paying in the likes of loan repayments, um, property maintenance, management fees, and various deductible expenses. Um, this may also be where rental income may be particularly high uh, due to strong demand, um, or interest rates are low, such as the current cycle that we're in now. Um, negative gearing is, is where rental income you receive is less than the total costs involved in owning that property. Um, and neutral gearing is, is as it suggests, is, is where you're in a neutral tax position. Um, the tax treatment and concessions available for each of these scenarios uh, differ uh, quite significantly. Um, so negative gearing, this is, this is typically where deductions are greater than your rental income received as mentioned. Um, and it's typically where the investor looks to make a profit from the eventual sale of the property. Um, and mitigate tax along the way, um, or even to accrue tax credits or losses. As you can see here in this example, uh, rental income of 60,000 um, with deductible expenses exceeding that, including loan interest, for instance, 
um, with a net negative income position per annum of 5,000. Living offshore, you're able to accrue these net income losses each year. Um, and negative gearing may have the potential to be an effective tax strategy, particularly if you intend on returning to Australia in the future and working. Um, the top marginal tax rates in Australia for individuals earning over 180,000 um, can be up to 45,000, uh, 45%. Um, and these carry forward losses can be quite a valuable tax deduction down the line. Um, if you've held a property for a long time um, and, and you've reduced the mortgage or if you have particularly high rental income, you may have a situa situation where rental income exceeds that of the loan interest and other deductible expenses. Um, in this scenario, we've got the same rental income. However, let's assume uh, the mortgage has been paid down or you've, you've built up an offset account. Um, those deductible expenses have been reduced um, and in this case, you've got a uh, positive income or positive net income of 30,000 per annum. Um, based on this example, if you had no other tax credits, you would pay a uh, non-resident tax rate starting at 32.5% on the first dollar of income. Um, that works out to be 9,750. Um, so so a, a concessional contribution to super is a good strategy here that's available um, to further reduce those um, that taxable income that, that you'd be paying at a non-resident tax rates. Um, however, there are some considerations. Uh, as mentioned by Andre earlier, uh, there are caps in place for superannuation. Um, in the positively geared scenario, the concessional contribution can offer that further tax deduction. Um, instead of paying tax at 32.5% uh, on the full 30,000, 30, you can instead contribute a maximum of 25,000 into super. Um, obviously noting that this is the current concessional limit for this year, um, that's increasing uh, to 27,500 from 1 July. So here in this scenario, you'd pay 15% on the way into superannuation. Um, the remaining net income at, at 5K um, being taxed at non-resident non rates. Um, and in this scenario, you'd, re you'd reduce your overall tax saving of around 4,000. So it's fairly significant. Um, the objective of this strategy is obviously twofold. Uh, one being minimizing the tax dollars um, on that personal contribution, but also growing your superannuation um, in that tax efficient environment for your retirement. Um, okay, so those strategies might be quite useful in mitigating ongoing tax liabilities, but uh, there's also the tax on sale. So you may be aware that if you sell your principal residence or, or home as an Australian tax resident, you'll receive a full exemption on paying any, any capital gains tax made since purchasing the property. Um, if you sell an investment property, uh, an Australian tax resident, the, the capital gains can commonly be discounted by up to 50% with the discounted capital gain added to your personal income for that year being subject to marginal tax rates. For foreign residents or non-residents for tax purposes, um, Previously, moving abroad, you could claim your home as your principal residence. You could claim a full exemption of CGT up to seven years. Um, this exemption has recently been abolished from June uh, last year. So an important change there for people who are not aware. Um, there is an exemption uh, for a period of up to six years where you can move back um, or repatriate back to Australia and still claim your home as your principal residence. Um, however, if you sell it while, while foreign resident or non-resident for tax purposes, this, this provision no longer applies. So as you can see here, we've just got an example as a, as a foreign resident, um, CGT that's applicable. Um, so here we've just got the cost base or purchase price of the property, uh, 1.2, uh, property sale at 2 million. The capital gain here is uh, 800,000. So as mentioned, um, the new rules that came in uh, from July 2020 mean selling your previous 
Um, stay in investment property while you're an expat means that you'll pay non-resident tax rates at 32.5% on the full capital gain. Um, so you can see here that that would add to a tax bill of 260,000. Um, however, there are some strategies that you can utilize to mitigate this. Um, carry forward losses is one. So as mentioned previously, um, Australian income losses in previous years can be accrued and carried forward to offset Australian taxable income or capital gains. So as you can see here, the, the same purchase price and, and sale price, um, utilizing uh, accrued losses from say negative gearing from previous years can be carried forward as tax credits um, and applied to the net capital gain to reduce, reduce that taxable capital gain um, there in the future. Uh, another one is uh, well, concessional contributions. Uh, from July 2018, uh, there, there was legislation passed where you can actually use uh, catch up concessional contributions. So going back and, and utilizing that unused cap. Um, if you make a concessional contribution, basically less than that, that cap, it can be accrued and carried forward to a maximum of five years. Um, so again, as you can see here, going back to 2019, um, if you haven't been making any contributions to superannuation or concessional contributions rather, um, you can accrue that, that unused cap that can be utilised um, in, in a future year to, to offset, say, the sale of a property. Um, it's quite a particular, it's particularly a useful strategy for expats living overseas, um, as mentioned, uh, Typically, we, we wouldn't be making these concessional contributions um, in some cases. Um, so it's available for investors that have less than 500,000. Um, and yeah, as mentioned, can be, can be quite useful uh, to offset these quite hefty capital gains. Um, so as you can see here, uh, maximizing carry forward losses um, or accrued losses in addition to triggering and applying the, the eligible catch-up concessional contributions, you may potentially significantly decrease your capital gains um, on selling that property if, if you're still a, a non-resident for tax purposes. Um, in this case, we've been able to reduce the, the taxable gain by 125,000. Um, at non-resident rates where, where you're paying 32.5% tax rate, um, you can see there's some pretty, uh, pretty decent savings there available. Um, the caveat I would say here is that while you're a foreign, foreign resident for tax purposes, um, the tax on property is, is quite unfavourable. So um, if you're considering to remain overseas for a prolonged period of time, um, it's probably best to consider uh, what investment options are available to you. Um, if you're a current property investor, um, it's also important to consider obviously the timing of the sale um, and whether it might be more favourable to wait until you're back in Australia and an Australian tax resident. Um, these strategies that we've discussed are also generally available to be utilised to offset capital gains on property um, as an Australian tax resident as well. Um, so for expats, there are typically two life events that trigger uh, when you should consider reviewing your financial plan and how your wealth is structured. Um, as mentioned here today, repatriation is a big one. Um, it's important as both your marginal tax rate is likely to increase, as well as the assets and investments, um, the income and gains that will now be taxable under Australian worldwide tax rules. Uh, this means that investments all over the world, not just in Australia, will become accessible. And, and secondly, um, is retirement planning. Uh, it's important given the contribution caps and restrictions to moving wealth into superannuation to be structured more tax effectively. Um, for these reasons, it's important to have a, have a strong financial plan in place, usually in the years leading up to retirement to ensure that your wealth is structured appropriately in, in time for your retirement. So, terms of repatriation strategies available, um, keeping it quite high level. Uh, 
One of the first being uh, is offshore portfolio bonds. So a portfolio bond is an investment wrapper type structure that is held offshore containing a simple life assurance contract to create a highly tax efficient um, vehicle for your investments. Um, typically they offer investment options such as cash, fixed interest, stocks, mutual funds, uh, in some cases property investments and a range of diversified um, investment options available. The products are designed to be held for 10 years due to the tax treatment um, under Australian tax purposes. But in this way, uh, a portfolio bond strategy can be used to restructure your existing investment wealth um, offshore tax efficiently prior to uh, repatriating back to Australia. So uh, portfolio bonds, they can be used to make a one-off contribution or an in-specie transfer of assets. So moving, say, stocks, um, bonds, et cetera, mutual funds uh, into, the, into the tax wrapper um, to be stru structured within this insurance wrapper to, be, to build out the investment portfolio and the view to access these funds after 10 years tax effectively, or in, the, in most cases, uh, tax free. Um, or the, the other option is um, portfolio bonds can also be used to make regular contributions over time. Um, there are strict mandates around uh, how much you can make each year or on that regular basis. Uh, basically, no, le no more than 125% of the immediately previous year's contribution. Um, but in this way, you, you can start that 10 year period to accessing the, the capital and returns tax free um, sooner. Um, so the next one, um, coming back, circling back to superannuation, Australian superannuation. Um, this is uh, quite a useful strategy to contribute large portions of your wealth into superannuation via the way of non concessional contributions. Um, these types of contributions are, are different to concessional where you get the tax deduction. These are basically after tax contributions that don't incur any tax on entry, um, but are an effective way to obviously uh, build, build wealth for, for more tax efficiency moving forward. Um, the, the tax rate within superannuation is basically 15% on any income earned and capital gains tax can be as low as uh, 10%. So it, as mentioned, it, it's, it's quite an effective way of uh, building your wealth more tax effectively compared to say the highest marginal tax rate at 45% um, going, back to, going back to Australia. So as mentioned, there, there are caps on contributions and restrictions to accessing your superannuation. Uh, these strategies need to be considered uh, quite carefully and, and, and planned quite carefully in, in, in the road to retirement. Um, however, after, after retiring or, retirement or, or reaching age 65, um, regardless, you may transfer the total accumulated balance of your superannuation, staying below the, the transfer balance cap of 1.7 million. Um, into a tax-free pension. So effectively all capital gains and income generated from the investments are then tax-free for your lifetime. Um, while you can also draw down a tax-free um, income stream to, to fund your retirement living expenses. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's it for today. Um, just, just finally, uh, a little bit about Ariana, obviously uh, we're independent and we're unaligned with any bank or institution, which means we're able to deliver on unconflicted financial advice propositions for our clients. Um, we offer high quality and bespoke strategic advice to our clients, encompassing all areas um, of clients' needs. Being uh, appropriately licensed across Asia and Australia, we're able to advise on this complete process or journey for expats, uh, for expats planning, repatriation and of course um, on that road to eventual retirement. And then finally our institutional investment capability with a proven track record. Um, we've got a proven track record of delivering value throughout the economic climate, 
economic cycle for our clients. Um, further to this, our size, we're also able to negotiate and pass on discounts from, from many of our providers that we, that we do work with. Um, it's pretty much it for, from our end today. Um, short and sharp, it's lunchtime. So, um, Andre, have we, have we got any, any questions on the line at all? I think you might be just on mute there, mate. Yep, I think one just came through, uh, Matty. I'll just read it out. Um, I would be keen to know how the announcement permitting an allowance contribution of 600,000 from a downsizing home sale to super impacts CGT payable on an asset owned over the seven year period. Can this be, can this be used to mitigate the capital gains? I'll try to answer that one. So uh, first and foremost, thanks very much for the question. Now the downsizer contribution uh, is strictly um, limited to a principal residence. So you need to actually own the home and lived in it for 10 years. So that's one of the uh, one of the requirements, if you like. And because it's actually a principal residence, uh, the CGT uh, component of it is not re relevant. There's no capital gains tax to pay. But what the government has done is say, okay, if you have, you know, if you sold your principal residence for $1 million, you can put up to 300,000 into superannuation without it affecting any of the other, you know, contribution uh, limits or caps that Maddie was talking about. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, Maddie, you have anything to um, add on that? Yeah, no, it looks like we've, we've got that. Cool. Okay, then. Um, again, if there aren't any... Oh, here we go. Sorry, there's one from Dane. A 45-day rule regarding non-resident status moving forward. Uh, do you have any further details surrounding this? Uh, four factors to consider in using in the new rulings. So I'm not sure about the 45-day rule. Uh, it's still, uh, so the, the question is, uh, is there a 45-day rule regarding non-resident status moving forward? Uh, do you have further details surrounding this? Um, so I might have to take that offline. Uh, in terms of the federal budget anyway, were, it's more to do with the, uh, the, the six month um, uh, residency test more than anything. Um, unless there's anything else we know about this, Matt? Uh, oh, sorry, I was just looking at the next question here. Yep, sure. Um, all right, we've got one here. So how do we, how do I roll forward a concessional cap if my contributions were below the 25K and I was not over the 250,000 combined limit before division 293 comes in. So I think um, it's a combination of two there, but um, in terms of the, the unused cap, um, th this is all tracked. So whether you've got several superannuation accounts, they're all linked to your tax file number. Um, so the ATO is aware of what you're making um, on an annual basis. So it only goes back to 2019 or the 2019 financial year. Uh, so to, coming up to this current financial year, you'd have three years worth um, of potential unused cap. So essentially it, it, that is just um, recorded and carried forward. Uh, when it comes time to making that concessional contribution, it is really important to update the ATO um, the fact that you may be going over the current year's concessional, but what you're doing is claiming those previous year's um, concessional unused concessional contribution cap. It's really important that you, you nominate the year as well. Um, you can't just use all of your unused cap. Uh, it's at a maximum of five years. Um, so there is um, sort of some steps involved and, and you have to be really careful in, in uh, notifying the ATO uh, around which years you're, you're claiming to use that unused cap um, and obviously the total um, if it's going over your current year 25K maximum cap. Maddie, I'll just, um, I think I've got further clarification with regards to that 45 day rule. So currently from a residence tax residency perspective, um, you know, absolutely right. There are a few steps that needs to be made 
uh, are to be established before they uh, establish whether your tax residency or not. Uh, in terms of the new proposed rules, they are going to use the six month or the 183 day rule to be the primary one. So you meet that rule, then you become either a non-resident or an Australian resident rule. Um, so it's going to be quite straightforward. It, they call it a bright line test, if you like. So rather than having you know, a number of you know, factors to determine your residency, it's only going to be the primary test is going to be the six month residency rule. And then if the ATO then still wants further clarification, they can then be, you know, uh, then look at other types of um, facts, if you like, in terms of principal residence, et cetera. But uh, the guide, if you like, the guiding light will be the, your, what your position is in terms of the six month, um, six, six month residency and physically being in Australia. I hope that that clarifies it. Um, if not, happy to bring it, um, bring it offline as well. I think that's us. Yep. All right then. So that, that's us. Thanks again for your uh, um, for your questions and also your attendance today. Please uh, be reminded that a recording will be sent to you um, after this uh, webinar, along with our details. So if you want to have further any further discussions uh, of any of the topics, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, but for now, have a really great weekend from Matt and myself, and please stay in touch. Thank you very much. <laughs>